Greetings in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. What a wonderful honor to come once again into the presence of God to worship Him in the beauty of His holiness. Indeed, once again, the Lord has given us another day to live, another day to serve Him, another day to walk with Him, another day to know Him. We are today living in unprecedented times. Never before, probably in our memory, have we been through times like this. Never before have we seen a, a pandemic, at least in my lifetime. I have not seen a pandemic. I've never lived through one. And we've never really understood how things pan out, how things turn out. Very unfortunately, in this time and season, many, many people have lost their lives around our nation and the nations of the world. In these days, as the second wave has hit many nations, particularly ours, Many people are losing their lives. Many are, those have morbidities and not well, are people that are affected and are losing their lives. And this breaks our heart. We are concerned. We are standing and, and seeing what is happening to lives of people that are broken. And I think in these times, many of us, we know of our neighbors or our acquaintances, or maybe even some of our loved ones who have passed away. Some who knew the Lord as their Lord and Savior, and some who didn't. It's a time like this that many of us wonder, why is this happening to us? Why, is, why are these kind of plagues happening in our life, in our generation? In our time of such technological advance, in our time of such scientific prowess, in these times, why is it that this kind of a plague has come into our life? The fact remains that all of us, uh, we are part of a fallen world. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned and walked in disobedience to the word of God, and Satan has been the lord of the air, we have been living in a fallen world. And the consequences of that fall, that sickness, plague, disease, many of these things, sin, are the consequences that have come into the world according to the word of God as a result of this fall. Man is still grappling with the challenges of these. It's at times when these challenges, tragedies, pain come close to home. These are the times we look for answers. These are the times that there are questions that are in every heart. Why are these things happening to us? These are the times we begin to reason. We begin to pray. And some begin to despair. These are the times our hearts are broken when we see our neighbors, our friends, and people we care about suffer, and some of them lose their lives. But as we look back in history, we see that these kind of circumstances, even though has not been there in my living memory, and in most of yours, as we look back in history, we see that these kind of plagues and pandemics have been there even in history. We see that the Spanish flu that was there also known as the 1918 influenza pandemic, was an unusually deadly influenza pandemic, which was like a common fever, but caused pneumonias and caused different other kinds of sicknesses. It lasted from February 1918 all the way till April of 1920. I was almost two years and two months of the pandemic. It infected about 500 million people. About a third of the world's population at that time, in 1920, the population of the world was around, you know, 15,500 million. And there were four consecutive waves, one after the other, the first wave, the second wave, the third wave, and the fourth. The death, death toll is typically estimated at that time to have been somewhere between 20 million and 50 million people. Although estimates range from a conservative 17 million that's 170 lakh, to possible high of 100 million, making it one of the deadliest pandemics in human history. As man began to travel and man began to go places and man began to you know, explore and the world has become a small global village, sicknesses and pandemics too have spread out. When we look in the Word of God, we try to find answers. We try to look at what is really going on, and different people come up with different things. And many of us are not even clear what should be our attitude 
in a time like this. In the Bible, we see that some of the reasons why plagues happen in the Bible, we see, is because when people begin to gather from scattered living, when people begin to gather together to community living, people begin to live in close quarters with each other, populations begin to grow, and thereby sicknesses which may have got you know, infected one or two or three people that lived in few places and far and few in between, begin to now spread between communities that begin to live closer to one another, that begin to rub shoulders with one another, that begin to associate and come to very close quarters because they were living in same villages or begin to live in same cities. Another reason why people begin to see plagues and, and these kind of sicknesses was because of poor sanitation or because of poor hygiene. In fact, it, is, uh, it, it has been some of these poor sanitation and hygiene situations that caused some of the great plagues in the past, the Black Death and many other plagues that were there in different parts of the world. Another reason that we see in the Bible, just like we saw where people began to come together, just as we saw as poor hygiene and many of those things, another reason we see in the Bible was, was divine wrath. We see among the Egyptians how God sent his ten plagues among the Egyptian people and told Pharaoh, let my people go so they may come and worship God in the wilderness. And it was only when Pharaoh allowed the people of God to go and worship in the wilderness, it's only then those plagues had ceased. So the solutions to these plagues in the Bible, we see, were dependent on the plague. There was no one size that fixed, fit all. When you look in the Bible, the solutions to the plague, if the problem of the plague was community living and everybody staying together, the solution in the Bible, the Bible would say such a person had to be isolated from the community. And the people that were infected, the people that were sick had to be isolated from which we learn today's methods of isolation. They were sent outside the camp. They'd have to live in a separate community until the infective period of that disease would pass. If the problem was poor sanitation and hygiene, then Bible talked about good hygiene. Bible said, you shall wash your hands, you shall wash your legs, that they shall, you know, you shall keep yourself clean, you shall keep your environment clean. You see, the, the, the Bible talked about good sanitation and good hygiene was the solution when people got infected and sick because of bad sanitation. And if the reason was divine wrath, the only solution forward was repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. But if my people who bear my name would humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways and pray, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. A healing on the land would come when people would walk right back to God. So depending on which the reason was, or maybe there are some more reasons that I have not covered, Depending on which the reason was, the Bible always gave that kind of a solution for the people of God. The solutions were depending on what the cause of the plague was. So, our temptation as believers is to quickly jump in and say, this is because of either this reason or that reason, because mankind wants to find a reason and attribute the morality of a circumstance to a particular reason. This is why it came. And of course, there are apocalyptical, you know, scriptures in the Bible and people are, are already thinking always of the doomsday. I want you to know until the work of God is done, the doomsday will not come. It is only in the fullness of time that God will unleash the, the, the plagues that are there in the book of Revelation. The Bible says that all through these different challenges, the saints of God walked with God through their different challenges. They walked with God, they believed God, even in those difficult years. The saints of God were not suffering for the first time in their life. Mankind has had suffering through wars, through pestilence, through plagues, through all kinds of challenges, through human doing, through human ignorance. They've had all kinds of problems. Believers and unbelievers, they've all gone through the pain. Both those that have known God and those that have not known the love of God, they've all gone through difficult times. Everybody, equally, in different times and circumstances, there isn't a common explanation that fits all. Some people, 
that trusted the Lord, that loved God, they saw miracle healing. I've seen tremendous miracle healing in my life. They saw miracle healing. And other people, they lost their lives. They did not see the answer to prayer. So people begin to now wonder, does God love us or does God not love us? Is God going to protect us? Is God not going to protect us? Some lost their faith. Some grew stronger in the faith. And others renewed their vision and told themselves, if this is what life is about, then I want to make a difference with the one life and the one chance that I have. So people of God, what must be our response to this plague, especially as it has now come close home? What must be our response to this plague, especially when people we care about, people we know, people, our dear families of the people we love are suffering under this plague? I've got many calls. People telling me how they've lost a dear one, how they've lost close family. In fact, even among our church family, people have lost close family, dear ones in some parts of the country. What is our response? Pastors have lost their life. Leaders of churches have lost their life. What is our response at this time? I believe we need to use everything the Word of God is saying at this time to understand what is a godly and right response. I believe we need to watch over what is the natural and we need to believe God for the supernatural. Hallelujah. We need to watch over what is the natural and we need to believe God for what is the supernatural. For a child of God, we are all, believers and unbelievers, are living in a fallen world. And so there are natural laws and there are supernatural laws. For example, gravity is a natural law that applies to everybody. Infectious diseases are a natural law. When I say natural law, I mean it's the law of nature. It applies to everybody, believers and unbelievers. That is why believers too can get infected and they can get sick. There are natural laws that are operating. And then there are the supernatural interventions of God. In the Bible, we see natural laws that are in place where the Bible says, if somebody is sick, I want you to isolate themselves. So isolation is a natural law in which God's word advised people to come out of sickness. But we also see supernatural laws at work where the Bible says they ex the disciples extended their hands and they prayed for the sick and they saw supernatural healing happening in the lives of everybody. Now you have to understand in the supernatural, not everybody got healed, even in Jesus' ministry or in Paul's ministry. Yet, the supernatural kept flowing. Yet, supernatural is still available. We need to understand that the natural laws are operating and the supernatural interventions of God are there. You look at David and Goliath's story. Everybody knows that David and Goliath, that's such a popular story. In fact, I hear unbelievers around the world saying that, you know, they use that phrase, he's facing his Goliath, which means he's facing an unprecedented circumstance. You look at David and Goliath's story. David was no match for Goliath. He was small, he was tiny, and when he stood before Goliath, he was no comparison. But there was a, there was a supernatural act. He took that stone and he threw that stone at Goliath. But before he threw that stone at Goliath, there was a natural act. He had practiced that day in and day out. When he was in the wilderness taking care of his father's sheep, he had practiced and he had practiced and he had practiced. He got good at it. He was so good at it that he said, let me fight this battle with how I know best to fight this battle. Let me fight this battle with the best ways that I know. So he used what was naturally his and then he trusted God for God to empower that stone and sink it right into Goliath's head. There was a supernatural intervention of God. I believe in every believer's life. We must understand what are the natural things we need to be careful about. And what are the supernatural things available to us according to God's word. You look in the life of Esther, Daniel, David, some key people. That went through challenges. David, when he, when he had plagues and he went through challenges or circumstances of Goliaths in his life. Look at Daniel. He had a challenge. He was in the lion's den and they were going to be killed and all of that. You look at Esther. When you study the story of Esther, it was a very challenging time. She was placed and positioned in that place, in, uh, you know, in that palace 
for a time such as then, when the Jews, their lives were going to be exterminated by a mighty kingdom. And Haman and his wicked people were planning the extermination of the Jews. At that time, you see that there are some principles that we can see, even from God's word, that, that teach us how we must understand and look at this particular plague that is causing trouble all around our lives. I believe, firstly, we need to understand the covenant that we are living in. We are living in a new covenant. I believe there are covenant promises. I believe there are covenant blessings. They, when Esther and her people, the Jewish people, were being threatened that their life was going to be exterminated, you see, one of the first things Esther did is that she called on the Lord and she began to, she began to talk about the covenant. Look at David. What did he do? He stood and looked at Goliath and he said, How dare this uncircumcised Philistine challenge the armies of the living God? He called on the covenant and he said, God, according to the covenant you made with your people Israel, this uncircumcised Philistine has no right to stand and to challenge the people of the living God. I believe one of the first things we must do as children of God, people of God, build your faith in the word of God. Remember the covenant. You know, as a family today, my, me and my family, uh, over a meal every day, we started reading Psalm 91. We just started declaring it over our home. We started proclaiming that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, you might say, well, there are people who have proclaimed it and who have also passed away. I know there are natural laws and then there is the supernatural. What are we doing? We are taking a hold of the supernatural law to overtake the natural law. What is that? We are remembering the covenant of God. The God who promised us. The God who's kept us alive all these years. The God who's, who's you know, has a work for us to do. I want to tell you something today. As long as God has got work for us to do, we cannot die. Hallelujah. God is going to stand by us. God is going to walk with us. God is going to teach us what it means to know him and love him and to walk in ways. You see, God never promised. Nowhere in the Bible did God promise a problem-free gospel. But God has promised, even though you walk through the waters, I am with you. You go through the fire, it will not burn you. I want you to know God has never promised a problem-free life. In fact, the Bible is full of people that had challenges, that had problems. And about this, it's a story of how God was with them. And God walked with them. And we also look in Hebrews and chapter 11, we see something very interesting. We see that there were challenges and not everybody got the promises of God. But they had believed God for a better resurrection. Nevertheless, I want you to know there still remains a covenant promise which is available for the children of God. So remember to walk in the covenant. Remind God and say, Lord, I am a child of God. I am standing in the covenant of God. I'm walking in the covenant of God. I am living according to the covenant of God. Remember the covenant. As you remember the covenant, walk in repentance. Because repentance is the foundation of the covenant. Many people talk about a covenant without knowing God or without loving God. When they are in trouble, they say, Lord, remember your covenant. But otherwise, they won't walk with God. I believe we need to walk in faith and we need to walk in repentance. Esther remembered the covenant. And Esther prayed like this. She said, you know, she was ready. She said, go assemble the Jews and call them all together. And they remembered the covenant that God had made with his people. They remembered the covenant that God made with the people of Israel. And she said, let us trust him. So the first thing I believe we need to understand how to be in these times of plague is to remember the covenant. The second thing we need to do is we need to number our days. Psalm 90 and verse 12 says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In these kinds of challenging times, I believe God wants us to number our days. Which means every one of us is going to die sooner or later. And I think it's important for us to know in our heart what is the length of days God has kept for us. And to know in our heart that how must I live in the light of the fact that I'm not going to live on forever. How can I live in the light of the fact that I'm going to live all the days ordained for me were written down in your book even before one of them came to be. When you see James and Peter in the Bible, two great men of God. James, 
gave his life up. He died, you know, even as he was serving God actively. I'm sure the church would have prayed for him when he was arrested. They prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and James died. But when it came to Peter, in Acts in chapter 12, Peter was arrested and he was put in prison. And the church prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And an angel of the Lord came and opened the gates of the prison and brought Peter out because his time was not yet come. We must understand what is our time. We must understand what kind of times we're living in. We must understand that we are living in a time where God wants us to serve him with all our heart. I believe James was beheaded. P. Paul was beheaded. But Peter was delivered until the fullness of his time came. So I believe we need to number our days and know in our heart that when our time is over, that we can joyfully go home, that we will not be afraid of anything. Thirdly, what do you do in these kind of times? I believe we do not live in fear. Every child of God must live a, a life free of fear, must live a life free of anxiety. Don't be afraid. What can man do to me? Do not fear. The Lord is my rock and my shield, my rampart, my God in whom I will trust. I believe believers must not live in fear. Daniel and his friends, were, they were going to be executed. And all the wise men of the land were going to be executed. But Daniel refused to fear. David standing before Goliath, he had a no fear attitude. How dare this Goliath challenge? Esther began to pray and she began to say, if I die, I die. Which means if I die, I die. But I refuse to step back from being an answer to the challenging circumstances that are there in our time and age. I want you to know, do not fear. Daniel was thrown into a lion's den. His friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were thrown into a burning furnace of fire. But there was a fourth one in the fire. Just like we sing that song, there's another in the fire standing next to me. He's going to stand next to you. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of the challenges and the circumstances that come your way. Fourthly, I believe it is time for us to trust God for miracles. If any of you are sick, or if there are people that are sick among you, I want you to know that there is a power of the Holy Spirit inside you. There is an anointing God has put inside of you. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, and He has given us authority to trample over snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. I believe life and death in the power of our tongue. We are able to operate because of the miraculous anointing that God has put on us. Now, I want you to know something. Now, people think because we proclaim the anointing, every time we pray for something, that it all must happen. I want you to know something. We don't pray for miracles because every time we pray that everything happens. We pray for miracles because God has given us provision in the new covenant to pray for miracles. And I believe you can pray for miracle healing. I believe you can lay hands on yourself. I believe you can pray over your home and your family and you can bless your home. I believe you can trust God for miracles. Esther was trusting God for a miracle. You see, she trusted God and she operated in the natural and trusted God for the supernatural. What was the natural she trusted God for? You see, when the queen could, uh, in those times, in the book of Esther, the queen could not walk into the presence of the king unless she was invited. That was how the law of the land was. She would be set aside or she would be killed. If she would break the law and step into that position. But she, what did she do? She, she asked the people of the land to pray. She trusted God. She trusted. She said, she told the people in Esther and chapter 4 and verse 16, Go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens will also fast the same way, and thus I will go to the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. She understood the natural. You pray for me, you fast, you all do that, and I will go, because I'm going to trust God for a supernatural. People of God, I want you to know supernatural miracles of God are still available. We see God, the Bible says, and the disciples, you know, they prayed they walked in the fear of God and God stretched forth his hands to do extraordinary miracles at the hands of the disciples. I want you to know, I've always lived by this in my heart. There are many people I've prayed for that have not been healed. 
But there are many, many, many people that I have prayed for, that I've seen supernatural healing. Even just the other day, one brother from Canada was telling me that there was someone there who, you know, who, who was, you know, very sick in, in bed and who could not get up and walk. And I was in a particular nation. I went there and prayed for that person. And years later, I get news right now that that person is in Canada serving the Lord and preaching the gospel. And he's a powerful evangelist that God is using him mightily in the Caribbean and in the, those parts of the world. I want you to know, it does not matter how many people are not healed. Just what if there are a whole lot of people that are ready to be healed because you would believe God for a miracle and you would stretch your hand out for healing. What if that God would heal what, the many people people that can miss out on their miracle because we have not been faithful to trust God for praying for miracles because we did not see everybody get healed. I want you to know, Oral Roberts said one day, he said like this, when he saw a blind eye of a woman open up miraculously, he looked at her and he said, just to see the smile on your face and to see how you're healed is worth every accusation and slander I've gone through in the television ministry. When people accused me of what kind of things I'm doing, he said, your smile and your healing is worth everything I've been through. So people of God, I want you to know, trust God for the miracles. Fifthly, I, uh, f uh, fifthly, I believe you need to use wisdom. What do we do in these times of plagues? Use wisdom to protect yourself. Use wisdom. Use the, the, you know, the scientific data we have. Use the two meter distance. Stand away from people. Double mask if you have to. Isolate yourself if you have to. Wash your hands. Use the you know, antiseptics or use the disinfectants or you know, use soap and water. Try not to go out unless it is an absolute necessity. Try to let this wave pass. Let this pass by. You know, they talk about the Spanish wave. It seems there were four waves in the Spanish flu. There were four waves. There was a first wave, which was a mild wave. And then after, and very few people died in that first wave. And then there was the second wave in the Spanish flu. That was the killer wave. So many people lost their lives in the second wave of the Spanish influenza. People of God, we're living in the second wave. I want you, every one of you to use wisdom. Isolate yourself. Stay indoors. Do not go out to get infected because the air will be carrying these viruses. Stay away from infective communities. Stay away from people that are being careless and going here and there. I want you to know, hopefully within a, this month, the second wave will pass. They say by the end of the month, the second wave is going to pass here in this nation. And if that is the case, people use all diligence. Follow the COVID protocols. Follow the laws of the land. Use wisdom. Use wisdom. Protect yourself. Use the PP kits if you have to. Use masks and gloves and use face shields and use whatever it takes. But more than anything, stay inside, people of God. Stay inside. There is a natural law and a supernatural law. You see, the natural law is like gravity. A plane is held to the ground because of the natural law. That's gravity. That's why we are all here on the ground. But when a plane begins to go fast on a runway, the wind under its wings begins to apply another law above the law of gravity. And this is called the law of th uh, aerodynamics. This aerodynamics law begins to override the natural law of gravity and begins to lift the plane into the air because of the propulsion of the engines. I want you to know there is a natural law of isolation and there is a supernatural law of divine healing. Many people are believing God for divine healing and ignoring the natural laws of isolation and staying in good distance and washing hands and all of that. Use wisdom, people of God, because those laws are also there in the word of God. Those laws are there in the word of God. So use wisdom to protect yourself. In fact, the Christian motive for hygiene and sanitation does not arise in self-preservation alone. As a child of God, we don't sanitize and keep ourselves clean just to protect ourselves. It is also our consideration to the neighbors around us. It is our consideration to the community around us. We isolate ourselves in, in, in an infective situation because we are considerate and caring to people. So why should you be careful if you're infected? You have to be careful, not because the people, government is asking you to isolate. You have to be careful because you, you're considerate to other people who might lose your life, their life because of our foolishness. You know, we, our wish to care for those who are sick. 
and i believe first and foremost not just the infected but for we should be also caring for those that are healthy early christians in europe first came up with the idea of hospitals as places that would be hygienically clean and places to provide care during the time of the plagues that was the concept that they came up with on the understanding that people's negligence of not knowing how to isolate that was the reason that diseases were spreading fast that's how the concept of hospitals also began in fact in those days they said it should be considered murder this kind of negligence it should be considered murder if people are not being careful and being considerate and being inconsiderate to other people that was the mindset to the people in europe at that time sixthly what do you do when you are in a time like this i believe sixthly we need to use compassion to help those that are in need in times of these like these in pandemic situations in the past believers stepped out to become a blessing colossians chapter 3 verse 12 says so as those who have been chosen of god holy and beloved put on a heart of compassion kindness humility gentleness and patience put on a heart of compassion god wants us to be compassionate i believe that you know there was a cyprian plague and even though great efforts of the cyprians were well known at that time the believers among the cyprian people they put on a heart of compassion and they begin to step out and they begin to go and take care of those that were sick thus dionysus from alexandria he writes like this most of our brothers and sisters they showed unbounding love and loyalty never sparing themselves thinking only about one another and they faced danger taking care of others today i want you to know we as believers can also care for others but i also want you to know we need to appreciate the government we need to appreciate the health care we need to appreciate you go to a shop and you see see people checking the temperatures or asking you to put gloves appreciate them honor them because they are trying to protect somebody's life honor them because you may get infected and you may not fall sick or maybe you be fine but they're doing that to protect a loved one of yours or someone else's i believe we need to be ministering to the people that are needy we need to help them we need to supply food and and supply other things that we can we did it when the first wave came we must do it as much as possible with us we must be able to do that even today we must go out and show acts of compassion seventhly i believe we need to understand how we need to spend our days i believe we need to what do we do in these times we must live for the most important things we must know lord if this is the end of our lives or just the other day i, I saw in the news uh, um, one of the ministers was saying no no corona is gone everything is gone nothing is there are no problems in one particular place and a few days later three days later or four days later he died of corona i want us to understand any one of us can be healthy one moment and we can be gone just this morning i read in the papers healthy young people healthy young people suddenly they just they call it the happy hypoxia which means the blood uh, saturation levels of oxygen begin to go down they are happy they don't know what's going on and that moments of happiness they suddenly collapse and they die because of less oxygen saturation in their blood this is affecting young people and i want you to know people of god i want you to know take care of your health but also understand how we must live these days john g lake and all operated in the supernatural john g lake during the plague in south africa he believed god supernaturally that nothing will happen to him and they also asked people to put you know put the ta- put that plague on him and from uh, you know, uh, and then take those plague uh, you know the the bacteria and look it under the microscope and he said you will find them dead there are people that operated in such supernatural faith and nothing happened to them and yet there are other people that operated in faith and yet they passed away for whatever reason there will be many reasons therefore understand the natural operate in it and trust god and operate even in the supernatural so how do we spend our days i think firstly we need to look towards heaven the bible says in second peter 3 verse 10 to 13 the bible says 
And the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night. Which means heavens and earth are going to pass away. All that is there is going to be passed away. And since all these things are going to be destroyed like this, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3.11, what sort of people ought you to be living holy conduct and in godliness, looking for the hastening and the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements with intense heat. But according to his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, which in righteousness dwells. People of God, I want you to know, let's live our lives looking forward to a new heaven and new earth. I believe we need to live our lives also storing up riches in heaven. The Bible says in Matthew's Gospel 6, 19 to 21, the Bible says, Do not store for yourself riches on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself riches in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. People of God, everything we are living for, everything we're storing up, everything we're working hard for, I want you to know, store up riches in heaven. Obey the will of God. Obey the word of God. Do what you can with the will of God, knowing the will of God. I believe these are the times we also need to give in compassion. We need to open our hearts and bless people that are in need. I believe we need to do what we can for the people that are in need. Let the love of God and let the love of people be evident, especially even though others are doing it, even though unbelieving communities are doing it. It's okay. Let the believers, let us be known for our love and for our compassion. Let us be known with what we can do. But what else must we do in these times? I believe we must stay in fellowship. We must stay in fellowship and prayer. Don't isolate yourself. Don't say, oh, I don't want to talk to anybody. Don't think that God is not prayer saving and protecting us. I want you to know some of the greatest men and women of faith lived in the times of great calamity, great wars, great pestilence, great problems. And I want you to know those times may be there, but a believer can always trust in Jesus. Stay in fellowship, stay in prayer. Don't abandon the faith and don't isolate yourself from the church. Stay in fellowship, pray together. It is amazing that people can be there to pray for you and pray for me. Finally, what do we do in times like this? Finally, don't fear death. Don't fear death because death is not the end of our life. Death is just the end of the trial room for a glorious eternity in heaven. Death is just the end of these light and momentary sufferings. Death is just the end of a short life God has given us so that we can make eternity matter. Death is just the end of what is so temporal. The Bible says death is taking off what is temporal, what is, you know, earthly and temporal, and putting on that which is eternal. I want you to know death can be exciting for the child of God. Death can be something we look forward to for a child of God. Don't be afraid of death because we look forward to a greater resurrection. Hebrews chapter 11 was 33 to 35. In Hebrews, we see that many of the great men of faith in Hebrews, they received what they believed God for. And there are many other great men and women of faith that did not receive what they were trusting God for. But yet they all believed and stood in faith. Why? Because they knew that death was not the end. There was a better resurrection. The Bible says, who by faith, in Hebrews 11, 33 to 35, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they may obtain a better resurrection. Some received their loved ones back to life because of a resurrection that happened miraculously. And others were tortured and they died. And they looked forward to a better resurrection. People of God, I want you to know that we are not afraid of death. I believe we all look forward to a greater resurrection. I'm excited about eternity. And I want every one of you that love Jesus to be excited about eternity. I want you to know this plague will pass. 
I want you to know this will not be there forever. This will pass in Jesus' mighty name. It will pass. In the meantime, let us keep our hearts on God. Let us keep the Lord reigning in our hearts. And let us remember these points that I talked about. Understand the covenant that God has planted you in. Number your days that you may have a heart of wisdom, knowing God, this is the time you've given me. And as long as God's got work for me to do, I cannot die. Thirdly, remember, don't live in fear. Live in faith. We are the children of faith. Fourthly, trust God for miracles. There is a natural law and God is still releasing the supernatural because of the Holy Spirit. Fifthly, use wisdom. Protect yourself. Pro use wisdom to protect yourself. Sixthly, use compassion for those that are in need. Care for those in need. Let us open our hearts, open our purses. Let's take care of people and love them. Seventhly, understand if this is the end of everybody, then how to spend our days? What if we don't live much longer? How do we want to spend our today? By looking forward to heaven, by working here for the kingdom of God here on earth, storing up our riches in heaven. How is that? By living here on earth according to God's will, by giving to those in need, by staying in fellowship. And finally, don't fear death, because death is just the beginning of eternity with God. May the Lord reign in your life here, and may the Lord reign in our death when we go to see him in eternity. He will reign at all times. Praise the Lord.